Well, good morning, Grace Chapel. Would you stand with me? Let's begin our worship this morning with song as we sing to our God and Creator. We're singing, Center My Life. Let's center our hearts and our affections towards our Lord this morning. Turn my eyes to see you, Jesus. In all your glory, turn my eyes to my heart to sing your wonder of how you love me to my heart. Oh. Your glories and turn my eyes. Teach my heart. Teach my heart with all your wisdom to live for heaven. Oh, teach my heart. Jesus, there is none more beautiful than Jesus. There is none more powerful than the risen Christ lifted high. Jesus, now be glorified. The risen Christ lifted high. Jesus, now be glorified. Amen. I just love that song of opening the service this morning, knowing that we are centering our life on the name of Jesus. Without that, we have nothing. 
And so this morning, as we turn our hearts there, let our call to worship lead us from Psalm 95, where it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. You see, we are the people of his pasture, and without our shepherd, we're lost. So as we center our life there in the name of Jesus, let us call upon his name. Let our hearts be turned towards him. Let us be known that we have been with Christ this morning. Let's continue in song. Praise God from whom all bless 
Rest in his presence now. God, you are so good. We sing your praises. With all creation, we join the saints of old, those today from all around the world singing your praises, God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Lord, direct our hearts as we turn towards you. Man of sorrow, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, will your love poured out over me? Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor on to Thee. Saint of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem. Reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, the rugged cross. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Oh, now my soul cries. Dead is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin oh, yeah, this has is it. no hold on me, whom the Son sets free. Oh, Come on, sing free again. Here we go. Indeed. Now my dead.
The stone is rolled away beyond the empty tomb. Oh, hallelujah, sing. Hallelujah, God be praised. He's risen from the yourself to be overcome with the grace of Christ. I hope it was just in that moment, being overwhelmed by the sacrifice of making a way when there was no way. Oh man, it's wonderful to be with you this morning. It's good to be together and lift our voices together, align our hearts together. Well, you can take a seat this morning. As you do that, if you'll pull out your bulletin, inside your bulletin you'll find a connect card. We care about you. We want to know what's going on in your life. And so this is one great way that we can stay connected with one another. So if you need to fill out the information in the front, if you've moved, if you need to update something, please do that. And then flip it over to the back. We have a spot for prayer requests here. Our staff and our elders take this very seriously. Um, They love, love to pray over you. So I challenge you to overwhelm them with your prayer requests this week. I'm not sure you can do it. (laughs) They love to spend time in prayer over you. So if you fill this out at the end of the service, go ahead and take it to one of the clear boxes by the exits. Drop it right in there. Unless it's your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. If it's your first time here today, hold on to this card. And instead of putting it in the box, walk it right out to one of our connect desks. There are people in blue shirts there. They are waiting to um, meet you in person, take your card, and give you a gift in return. Who doesn't like a present? I do. So go ahead. If it's your first time, take it on out there and get you a gift. That'd be great. Um, Some things to make you aware of going on in our church. Um, VBS is coming up at the end of this month, June. Yeah. June. We got two or three people who are excited about it. June 24th through the 28th from 9 in the morning until 12 o'clock. We want you to bring your kids, and today, listen up, is the last day that you can register for VBS, so please, please don't miss it, and don't push it until it's like a college assignment where it's 11.59 and 58 seconds, don't do that, okay? In fact, if you have your phone with you, go ahead and whip it out, hopefully you've downloaded the Grace Chapel app, you can register right there, it can't get any easier than that, so before Josh comes up to preach... Don't do it while he's doing that and get me in trouble. Everybody looking at their phone. Pull it out. Register. Bring your, um, bring your children. Bring the kids on your street. Bring the kids from school that your kids want to see and they don't get to see them over the summer. Please, please, don't miss this week. It's $35 um, per kid, and they will not accept late registration. So if you wake up tomorrow, you're out of luck. Okay? You get the point. Register, right? Okay. Um, also, this summer... Meeting at um, Steve Whitlock's house. We have a college group. Um, Kurt Roberts, our youth pastor, is also involved with that group. They've been meeting for a couple weeks now and really are having such a fabulous time of fellowship, of getting in the word together and just being together in community. And they would love for you to join them. It's on Sunday nights. begins at 530, and you get free food. So just go, okay? If you're in college, just go. It'll be great. They meet in Castle Rock, and they would love to have you. It's now this time of the service where we have the opportunity, the privilege to give back to God with our tithes and our offerings. Um, I've said it before and I'll continue to say it that this is not something we do just to make the top line, meet the bottom line. We really truly believe here at Grace Chapel that uh, this is an act of worship in of itself. It's part of what we do. It's part of our ethos and it's what God has called us to do. In fact, in the Bible it tells us that God um, loves a cheerful giver. So Grace Chapel, it's now time to take your offering. As the ushers come forward, let me pray. Father God, we 
we now delight in giving you, um, giving back to you what you have so graciously given to us. So Lord, take these gifts, take these offerings, um, and use them. May your word go forth from here, and may um, your work be done. Use us as your hands and your feet, and use the gifts that we give as an extension of that. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea Without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Sing praise the Lord Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Would you stand with me? Let's sing. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. One Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He's lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is mine. His mercy is more, stronger, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Sins. 
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm keenly aware that your mercy is more than even the magnitude of the sins that are represented by the sinners in this room. That no matter what we have done, no matter what we will do in our life, if we were to take all of our sin, your mercy is more. And for that, we are so grateful. Father, we thank you for giving us your forgiveness for where we've gone wrong and your acceptance for what Christ did right. We thank you that we are welcomed into your presence to be able to sing songs as we have done, to pray prayers as we have done, and now to look at your word. Father, I pray that you will speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are aware that the only way we could understand this word is by you giving us mercy now in this moment. So speak, please speak. And know that we are listening and ready to be transformed. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace. And thank you most of all for your son. It's in his perfect name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good to be with you. We've had those moments, I'm sure, probably even happened to you recently, maybe this week, where you're on the phone and you're like, hello? 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 I think we all have that, right? Living in the cell phone day and age that we're in. Like, hello, can you, can you hear me? And there's the, that moment where you hope that it was just the signal that was dropped and that the person didn't actually hang up, right? Have you ever had that moment where you say something serious or maybe slightly assertive and then, hello, hello, hello? You hope that they didn't actually hang up. And there are times where it feels like, well, maybe they did. Maybe that, maybe that happened on purpose or maybe the signal just dropped. Hello, are you there? And if, if, you can't, if you can't hear them, then you'll do anything to try to get the signal back, right? You stand on one foot, you start walking and ducking and going all like this, trying to get them to come in loud and clear. It's a problem that we all have in this cell phone life that we live in, but if we're honest, it's something that happens also in our prayer life. Just as it feels like there are times where we drop calls uh, with our cell phones, so it feels like there are times where our prayers get dropped, where we feel like for a moment the reception isn't clear, or we feel like God on the other end of the line is not hearing us or maybe he accidentally pushed mute. That's what happened. We were praying and he can hear us. We know he cares and we know that he's listening to every word, but we cannot hear him back. Have you had that moment? I mean, if we're honest, prayer is hard enough to understand how it works and that God would listen to us. But it's even more complex when we feel like God is not responding. When we get into our prayer life and we desire an answer and we say, God, please, will you give me some sign of your presence and your power? Will you please respond? And it feels like the line is quiet. We get confused because confusion on a cell phone causes us confusion. What just happened? Did, did, did they hang up or was it a lost signal? And silence, silence on a prayer line also feels like confusion. What happened? God, where are you? Why are you not responding? Jesus taught us how to pray it's the Lord's Prayer. It's one of the ways that we've mod he modeled prayer for us. It's easy enough to remember. It's something that most of us have memorized. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then there's this line in there, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. It's what I've entitled this series, but it's this small little statement that Jesus said we can pray like this. We can ask God whatever happens in heaven, make it also happen on earth. Just as your will is always perfectly fulfilled in heaven, God, will you please fulfill your will perfectly in my life now? He said that we can pray that way, but if we're honest, there are times we say, God, I want your will. God, I need you to, to be clear with me. God, show me the way, and it feels like there's no response. I want today for us to practically talk about what does it mean for us to ask for his kingdom to come. When we pray and we, and we say, Lord, I want your will to happen in my life, what does that mean? And how do we actually get a response or a reaction out of God that will then say, okay, now my will can be fulfilled in your life? I've entitled my message today, Praying to Gain a Response from God, or to Gain God's Response. Praying to Gain God's Response. This isn't an exhaustive treatment on prayer. It isn't 
uh, a, a, a full study on all the things you should do in your prayer life. But I know what it's like to want God to respond and feel like he's not. And so I want to derive from this passage what it means for me to pray in such a way that God actually responds. Now, truth be told, God always responds. Sometimes he responds with no, and I don't like that one. Sometimes he responds with wait, and I almost equally as much don't like that answer. And sometimes he responds with just trust me on this one. God's always responding. Now we want him to respond, yes, or oh, right now, or immediately. I will give that to you, right? That's, that's what we want. But that's not always how he responds. And in fact, there are times where it seems like he's taking forever to respond. Are you sure it's not on mute, God? I, I know you're there, but are you sure it's not on mute? Because we, we can identify with the feeling of wanting something now. I mean, that's the world we live in, right? I can look something up on my phone and have an immediate answer on whatever it is that I look up on my phone. We live in a now or an instant world. Think of our world, right? We have all sorts of things that are instant. We've created meals that are instant. You want lunch in a minute or less? There's grocery aisles committed to that. You can do rice in a minute or less, right? Do you remember the day when we used to have to wait for the TV to warm up before we could watch a show? Uh, we had one TV in our home, maybe because my dad decided we didn't need to spend any more money on another TV. But we had this one TV that, 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 that you had to wait for the little white dot in the middle to suddenly warm up and grow into a picture, right? Do you remember those things? But nowadays, like, if it doesn't turn on, we're like, what, 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 is, what, what is wrong with this, right? We want instant response. We want it now. And the truth is that we want the same from God. We want something instant from him all of the time in all of our relationships, but definitely in our relationship with God. We say, God, I want instant wholeness. I want instant holiness. I want you to instantly forgive me. I want the consequences of my sin to instantly be done. We long for instant relationship with God. And through our study in the book of Daniel, I have learned, and I hope you have as well, that following God doesn't always bring about instant results. Daniel had to be faithful over the course of his life. And we see in the book of Daniel that the, the time scale and the timeline that God was using to restore his people and to restore Daniel and the broken world that they live in was much longer than any of us would have ever thought it had to be, especially Daniel. Daniel had to wait. He had to wait on a response from God as he lived in a foreign country, waiting to get back to the land that God had promised to them. He had to wait. I've learned through the book of Daniel and many other places in the Bible that a relationship with God isn't always about an instant response. Sometimes it is just about waiting. But, I, but I've derived that waiting on God means that I'm trusting God. When Isaiah tells us to wait upon the Lord, it is to say we are to trust him. When I look at Romans chapter 8, and trusting God with the outcome of every situation. I'm waiting on the situation to pan out, and while I'm waiting, I'm trusting. In Daniel's situation, he had to wait on the Lord, and as he waited, he grew in his trust. What does it mean to pray in such a way that we get God's response, even if it's not instant? What does it mean to pray in such a way that when, when we pray, we anticipate his response and we grow in our trust in the waiting? Those are the questions I want to answer today. Uh, today, I want to join Daniel, this man who was exiled from his land who for nearly 70 years had to wait on the Lord to answer prayers of deliverance so they may return home. He had to wait patiently. He longed to go home, but he waited. He was a man that I believe had calloused knees and a feeble voice from all the times he prayed, asking God, please, will you deliver us? Will you deliver us? Will you deliver us? Eventually, God would deliver them, God heard every one of their, his prayers, even if he felt like God didn't. Today, I want to show you what it means to pray in such a way that you gain God's response in the way that Daniel was able to gain his response. 
But you'll see in Daniel's life, as you've probably seen already, it isn't so much about the words you pray as much as it is the heart from which you pray or the tone you have when you pray. I've learned that when it comes to praying to get God's response, it is the heart that matters the most. The prayers that get God's attention come from the person who value God's lordship in their life. It was no doubt that Daniel valued God's lordship. This is a big word. But it means that we understand that he is sovereign, as we've already defined, fully in power over even the grit and the grime of our life. He's able to correct us. He's able to discipline us. He's able to give us mercy and grace. He has all of these things. He's sustaining my life. He's Lord, Lord of my life. Daniel understood what it meant to have God as Lord of his life. And that ultimately, my friends, is the heart from which we gain God's response. And when we understand that he is over everything and working through everything, then when we pray, he hears us. As you'll see in the passage that we're looking at today, and again, hopefully you've seen this throughout the entire book of Daniel, he understands humility. He understands what it means to be humble and he understood his need to have a right view of God's bigness in light of his smallness or the other way around. He understood God's bigness and therefore he understood his smallness. He knew he was small and so he sought God in all of his sovereign power in his life. He got what it means to have God as Lord over his life, as his leader and as a sovereign king. The biblical application that we're going to get to today, I hope, will cultivate in you a responsiveness to the hand of God on your life, no matter how firm or soft it may be. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 23 of this chapter. It's found on page 746. You can follow along in the Grace Chapel app. As always, you can text me any questions. I look at those throughout the week, and those inform my preaching for you, and those help me indirectly answer your questions here in the message. So please, get your eyes on this passage. It's an important passage. If you don't have a Bible, use the one in front of you, and even take it home with you, because I want to make sure you're continually studying God's Word. And we're going to be looking at Daniel, this man who is now probably in his early 80s. We met him back in 605 B.C. in chapter 1. He was maybe 13, 14 years old when we first met him. He'd just been taken from his land, and now he's lived in this land for 66 years. 66 years he's been in exile, away from Jerusalem, away from the original temple that was built for God's presence to dwell. He has maybe four more years in exile before they're released and taken back to their promised land. He's now late in life, and he's trusting the Lord with what's happening. He's seen evil king after evil king in his lifetime. He's had dreams about evil kings to come. Verse 1 tells us that he's under King Darius, who was no doubt an evil king in and of himself. And one more example of God's discipline upon the chosen people, his chosen people. They had to live under one more evil king. And in the first year of his reign, it says in verse 2, Daniel was trying to find how long, O oh Lord, will this go on? In other words, Daniel's trying to say, when are you going to respond, God? Because for 66 years, we've been waiting for you to pick up the other end of the phone and tell us when this is over. And he was trying to figure out how long it will go. So he looks at the book of the numbers of years. He finds at the book the number of years that according to the word of the Lord, Jeremiah, the prophet, would pass before the end of this desolation of Jerusalem. And he finds namely that it is 70 years. This is a light bulb moment for Daniel. He's reading the Bible, which I love that. He has the same scriptures that we do. Not all of them, obviously, but he had many of the scriptures that we do. He's reading this book of Jeremiah, and he's trying to figure out, God, what is it that you're going to say? How long are we going to be in exile? How long is this going to go on? And he finds that Jeremiah says it will last 70 years. I think it's around chapter 10. And all of a sudden, he's, imp he's impacted by this. He's now much older in his life. He's sensitive to God's word. He, know God, he knows that God's directing them. But not only is he sensitive to God's word to find relief, but he all of a sudden becomes somewhat overwhelmed by the fact that God has anger and discipline towards his people. If you read the passages in Jeremiah, that's very clear. 
If you've seen the dreams that happened in Daniel 7 and 8, it's clear that God was not happy with the evil that was in the world. But in this moment, he has this tender heart to realize that the anger of the Lord has brought a curse upon his people. He realizes that the anger of the Lord has allowed this disaster. He realizes that the anger of the Lord is against them because they have done what was wrong in God's eyes. So what does he do? He sits with sackcloth and ashes and he mourns. It means literally he gets rid of his nice robes, which probably had very nice fabric and were kingly because of his position there in Babylon. And he puts those away. He puts on this rough material that was abrasive to his skin. And he would sit with ashes, sometimes even on a pile of ashes. They would sit there and they would mourn. Look at verse 3. It says, then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleading for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. He wasn't eating anything. He's being abrasive to his skin, almost as a physical sign of the turmoil on the inside. And he's sitting there on burnt rubble. But he didn't just sit in sadness. He didn't just sit and say, oh man, we've been so bad. He prayed and confessed It says that he prayed to the Lord and made confession. It was his confession that got the attention of God. It was his humility that got the attention of God. It was his brokenness that got the attention of God. But let me be clear about one thing. It was not his sin that was put in the spotlight or the sin of his people. That's not what he was focusing on. Rather, he was focusing on the holiness and the greatness of God. That's what was on display. Well, he's going to spend a bunch of verses talking about what they had done wrong. wrong. He is much more moved by the fact that after just reading Jeremiah, God is still great, that his anger is still righteous, He goes on about Yahweh. Eight times in this chapter, he uses the name for God, Yahweh. And only in this chapter does he use the name for God, Yahweh. Only in this chapter does he refer to God as the Lord. Our English translations, in the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, whatever translation you look at regularly, you'll see that Yahweh is often translated using small capital letters. It means that this is Yahweh. This is the Lord. And Yahweh means redeemer or recoverer. It's different than Elohim or Adonai, these other Hebrew names of God that mean creator or king of the universe. Yahweh is much more personal. It's redeemer, recoverer. It is the one who can regain what is lost. He calls him Yahweh making Yahweh the focus of his prayer, not his own sin. He's focusing this entire chapter, it seems, on the God of Israel who keeps his covenants, who keeps his promises. It's as if he says, you are Yahweh. You are the one who responds and regains what has been taken. You restore people after their sin. Only God can do that. Daniel turns his head And I'm grateful for this as a preacher. He turns his head from the craziness of seven and eight with beasts and horns and all these crazy things, talking about the evil of the world, to now talking about the evil that exists within his own life, within his own people. We know from chapter seven and eight how God feels about the evil of the world. He destroys the beasts, he takes away their power. He's the ancient of days, the all-powerful one who comes against the evil in the world. We know that from 7 and 8. But in Daniel chapter 9, we go from the ancient of days, the all-powerful God, the one who has wrath and a fiery throne, to now seeing God referred to as Yahweh, a personal regainer and redeemer of what has been lost in light of sin. Daniel, with this focus on the Lord, confesses his sin. But he doesn't move too quickly past the awesomeness of God. Look at verse 4, how he starts his prayer. 
an application for you is this. Before I even read the verse, I want you to get this application. You can write this down, write it in the margin of your Bible even. The best prayers start with the highest view of God. The best prayers start with the highest view of God. And chapter 9, verse 4 of Daniel captures that perfectly. He's talking about the highness of God. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. He prays in such a way to contrast the perfection of God with the imperfection of his people. He's going to get to the imperfection of his people. But he starts with the perfection of God. Look at the things that he acknowledges about God, just right here in this verse. He says, you are awesome, you are great, you are steadfast in love, you are faithful to keep commandments. And then look down at verse 7. It says, you are righteous. Daniel is acknowledging that God is the only one who is awesome, great, able to keep his commandments, and righteous. He's the only one that's awesome. I use that word, awesome, way too much in my life. I have guacamole, and I go, man, this is awesome, right? I'll say things are awesome. It's an awesome day. Dude, you are awesome, right? Even my own son. My own son is here today. This is Charlie. We call him Spurgeon. I tell him all the time, you're awesome. And I didn't know he was going to wear this outfit to church today, but I looked at it during our worship set. His shirt says, Captain Awesome, (laughs) right? I think he's Captain Awesome. I think you're pretty awesome. But you know, awesome is only to be used for God. He is the sum of our awe. So as awesome as I think Charlie is, there is only one God who is truly awesome. His outfit is heretical, right? It's wrong. He's not Captain Awesome. God is Captain Awesome, right? But I still love you. God is awesome. He's great. He's righteous. The best prayers start with the highest view of God. But I also believe that the best prayers have the most honest view of ourselves. They start with the highest view of God, but they have the most honest view of ourselves. When we confess our sin to God, we contrast our wretchedness, our brokenness with the beauty of his perfection. Look at verse 5. Daniel says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turned aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servant, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings or our princes and our fathers, to all the people of the land. He keeps going all the way through verse 19, listing all the things that they had done wrong. Now, the main thing that they did wrong was that they did not listen to the voice of God. That's the main thing that they did. It's four times mentioned throughout all of these verses. All of it could be under that heading. They did not listen to the voice of God. So he starts by saying, God is awesome. He is great. He is righteous. The best prayers start with the highest view of God. But then the best prayers move on to the most honest view of ourselves. And Daniel begins to acknowledge several things. He said, we have sinned and done wrong. We have sinned and done wrong. We have acted wickedly, he says. We have turned aside from your commandments. We have rebelled. We have had unfaithfulness. We have not listened to the prophets. We have disobeyed. And then to be more pointed, it's kind of the same thing as disobeyed, but to be more pointed, he says several times, we did not listen to your voice. Now, my friends, this... This right side of this list, left side being what's true about God, right side being what's true about these people, if we look at that list, every single one of us, if we're honest people, every single one of us would say, those things are true of me as well. Honest people have to admit that we too have done exactly what is listed here. We have sinned and done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We've turned aside from commandments. We've rebelled. We've had unfaithfulness. We've not listened to the prophets. We've disobeyed and we did not obey the voice of God. There is not one person that can look at this list and go, yeah, I'm good. I didn't do that. 
Liar. You did. Every one of us did that. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, if you go on saying that there is no sin in you, you are lying. There is no truth in you. You're deceiving yourself. So you're prideful enough to say there for a moment, I haven't sinned against God. No, 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 you, know, you have. We all have done these things that Daniel lists about his people, and they're true about our people and us as well. We all have sinned in many ways. We all have what I call our hall of shame a place we never like to go, we don't want to go, and we for sure don't want to give tours to other people. We don't like showing our hall of shame to anyone else because we don't want to even admit that it exists. But in Daniel 9, he takes a tour down the hall of shame, even saying two times in verse 7 and 8, we had shame, we had shame. Why did they have shame? Because they sinned against God. Shame is a lot like having a dark balloon in our life that hangs onto us or hangs over our head. Thank you, Joey. It's like having a dark balloon, a dark emotion, a dark feeling over us. Now, guilt is our guilty verdict. It is you have done something wrong against God and are guilty. Shame is the result that comes from guilt. We are guilty. We all have sinned. We all have done what is wicked in God's eyes. We all have not listened to his voice. That's the verdict. That's what we've done wrong. But shame is the result of that verdict in our life. And if we're honest, we try to take the shame in our life and we try to push it down and hold it down and hope that nobody sees it and keep it under the water and suffocate it. But it pops up like an evil surprise telling us millions of lies that we're not good enough and that we can't be accepted by God. Shame is a very real emotion, and it's something that plagues most of us most of the time. Because we're guilty. Because we've done wrong. And shame feels so real. You don't have to answer this, but let's be honest. Have you ever felt like that? Have you felt like you got that black balloon of shame hanging over you? Clinging to you? Daniel certainly he could have tried to minimize it. He could have tried to hide it. He could have said, God, you know, there's reasons we've acted the way that we've acted. And there's some things we did wrong. And there's nothing here to look at. But he didn't. He was honest about the things he did wrong. He was honest about the shame that had clung to him so tightly. Shame does cling to us. And it gives us a sense of bondage in our life. But I say to you, my friends, it's the opposite of what God has created for us. God created for us to live free. Back in the Garden of Eden, God created that you and I would be able to be free in a relationship with God without any shame. And yet when sin crept into the world and the first two humans sinned against God, doing exactly what he said not to do, then they were ashamed. And they went and hid behind the bush and hoping that God wouldn't see them and hiding their parts because they felt exposed. But God knew exactly what they had done. And there was no hiding. And their shame must have felt overwhelming. But Christ came to say, I can free you from the shame. I can free you from the guilty verdict that you deserve. I can willingly lay my life down for you. In fact, I will so that your sin will be paid for. So if Christ has freed us from the eternal consequence of our sin, knowing that I can now have a right relationship with God all the way back to what God originally created in the Garden of Eden, then why is it that I still feel shame? Why is it that there are still consequences for my sin? I think shame is just one of many consequences that we have in our life because of the sinful choices that we make. Now, I've lived long enough to know that you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. And I've lived long enough to know that God allows shame in our life almost as a, a discipline to correct in us what must be corrected so that we never go back there again. We may choose our sin, but we cannot choose our consequence, and there are seasons in our life where we experience shame, or I'm gonna use a biblical word, brokenness. And even though God has forgiven us of our sin and what we did wrong, and we have a 
a relationship with him, if we have faith in Christ, he still disciplines us in order to create a new heart of faithfulness that would not have been there if we hadn't walked through the consequence or the shame. In the Old Testament, there's many examples of this where God punished his people in the desert. They, they were in the desert, Deuteronomy tells us, as an act of discipline from God. Did he forgive them? Would he forgive them? Yes, but they still were disciplined. The people in Israel had many attacks from surrounding countries as a way of God disciplining them for their disobedience. Kings had prophets yell at them, you're doing what's wrong. God will judge you or discipline you. God disciplines those he loves. And we must believe that the discipline of God in our life is for our good. Oh, please, Father. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God disciplines us for our sin, but it is short-term pain for long-term gain. He disciplines us, but it is short-term pain for long-term gain. And oh, it hurts. The discipline of God hurts. The shame that feels overwhelming hurts at times. But the necessity of God's discipline is to deter us from destruction and return us to wholeness. Or should I say holiness? He disciplines us to make us more passionate for righteousness and to make us abhor wickedness in our life. God has anger. Yes, it is true. God is loving, but he has anger. He has anger towards our sin. He has anger towards our culpability to fall into the very things he commanded that we do not do. But when we have a high view of God, it is then that we will have a low view of ourselves, or should I say a right view of ourselves, and we, we will acknowledge where we go off base. Our response to the grace of God isn't any more concealing or trying to justify. But rather we say, God, I got this shame that's overwhelming and I'm broken and I hate it. And I'm humbly asking you to correct me and change my life and return me back to a right relationship with you so that I never go back to that mistake I made in my past. Friends, I believe that shame can be a catalyst for confession. Shame can be the very thing that propels us to confess our sin to God. That was true for Daniel. Daniel confessed his sin to the Lord. Verse 20 summarizes what he did in verse 4 through 19. It says that I prayed and confessed. The NIV says I was praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people. Daniel, Daniel models for us a few things. When we confess our sin, here's the first thing I think Daniel models for us. When we confess our sin, the anger of the Lord is seen correctly. He realizes that God's not happy with what he did. But he sees God's anger in contrast with what God's creating in him. I realize you're holy and you're angry because I'm imperfect. I realize that you're, you're just and right because I'm wrong and sinful. I know that you're angry, and I'm actually seeing it correctly, even with the shame that's got a hold of me. I realize what I did was wrong. You see, when we confess our sin and even our shame to the Lord, it's there that he begins to work in our heart a passion for the things that he's passionate about. When we confess our sin, it all of a sudden allows his anger to look like that black cloth that's spread behind the beautiful diamond. The black cloth is... The wrath of God, the justice of God that I deserve, the shame that plagues me, that's the black cloth, but the diamond in all of its glowing beauty is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I realize his anger is proper, then I realize that the gospel is all the more merciful. When we confess our sin, the anger of God is seen correctly, but the second thing that happens is that our shame is only temporary. When we come to a place of confessing our sin, we see that the shame can and will go away eventually, hopefully in this life, yes, but eventually forever 
as we live in eternity with God. Shame is only temporary. Discipline is short-term pain with long-term gain. And the dark balloon of shame over your life, even for the self-inflicted wounds that you have done to yourself because you've chosen to not listen to God, this dark balloon, it hangs over your head, but God promises through the gospel of Jesus Christ you can be set free. So he comes in and he says, listen, I'm freeing you through the power of my son to have no more shame, to be freed from the consequence you deserve for all of eternity, but even now in this life, to walk and to be freed by the power of the Holy Spirit daily telling me, you don't have to believe those lies anymore. For freedom, Christ came to set us free. For freedom, total freedom. Guidelines for confessing to the Lord or reasons to confess to the Lord. Here's top of my list. When I confess to the Lord where I went wrong, it's there that I will begin to overcome my shame and to see God's mercy more fully. Confessing where you went wrong at first is key. You got to go back to where you got off track. See, the shame is gone. It's gone. (laughs) You go back to where you got off track. And you trust that by confessing this to the Lord, he'll show you a proper view of his anger, but he'll release you from the shame that's overwhelming to you. We tend to think of confession is simply telling someone else about our sin. I think it's, it's more than that. Confession is what I call verbalized humility. Confession is verbalized humility. It's speaking to God and maybe other people about where you went wrong or what you did, including the sin that has happened in your life. Confession is verbalized humility, speaking to God about what is true. And that includes your sin. It's about seeing yourself for who you are and seeing God for who he is. And Daniel sees God's mercy and God's righteousness and God's awesomeness most clearly when he realizes his own failures in light of God's perfection. Shame can be gone. If true, heartfelt confession takes place. So you want to know the prayer that gets the response of God? It's a humble heart, a heart that submits to his lordship, a heart that has a high view of who God is, but a heart that's not afraid to admit where they went wrong. Look at how God responds, verse 20 through 23. God responds to Daniel's prayer. It says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, and presenting my plea before the Lord, my God, for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who I'd seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight. At the time of the evening sacrifice, he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Notice what God did not say. God did not say, you're right. You should be ashamed of yourself. You scum. God didn't say any of that. God simply gives one main statement here from Gabriel. Yes, he gave him understanding, but it says, you are greatly loved. (laughs) Daniel just went on for 15 verses talking about how shameful he was in the sin of his people. Are you kidding me? The prayer that God, God's response was that prayer. And then God comes back through this angelic messenger and says, you are greatly loved. That's unbelievable. When we confess our sin, I think another thing happens that I see modeled here by Daniel. And that is that the Lord comforts us with his love and his mercy. He could have said about a billion other things. But instead he said, you are greatly loved. Listen, my friends, there's nothing you can ever say that will surprise God. 
There's not one thing you will ever confess to the Lord and he'll go, oh, you did that? He never says that. He knows the depths of your sin, but he knows the depths of his own grace even more. Praying our confessions to the Lord at very least entails us to cry out to the Lord as Daniel has modeled here. But it is there in the moment as we're crying out that we must realize the call has not been dropped. The mute button has not been pushed. Because he responds, you are greatly loved. When we pray and we confess, he meets us with his grace and he gives us enough mercy to keep on moving, to realize the lasting forgiveness that he's given us. Now I know, I know that some of you find it hard to pray, period. I know that some of you find it hard to pray about good things. You just forget because things are good. I know that some of you find it really hard to pray about really hard things, but I know that most everyone in this room finds it terribly hard to pray about the things we've done wrong. But when we're willing to open up our hearts and tell the Lord where we've gone wrong, we must realize that God's big enough for those moments. Daniel, he was feeling ashamed. He confessed it. He reflected on his own mess and the mess of his people. But he was quickly assured when he heard these words of God, you are greatly loved. (laughs) I love that. You know how for years here, four years, in fact, I've said, you are loved? When I first started here as pastor, I, I started saying at the end of every message, you are loved, you are loved. And I brought that from a church I pastored at before, and we say, you are loved, you are loved. And now it's caught on, and we all say, you are loved, and it's on banners around here. And you'll see us, our worship leaders say it at the end of every service, you are loved. We want you to know you are loved, but I want to change the phrase. Can I do that? I want to stop just saying, you are loved, and I want us to start saying, you are greatly loved. Because that's exactly what God speaks here. You are greatly loved. In fact, it's the same thing that was spoken to Mary when she was told she was going to have Jesus in her womb. The angel shows up and says, you are greatly loved. Not partially loved, not mostly loved, not loved only on the good days. You are greatly loved. And my friends, that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you are greatly loved, that God loved you even though you were full of sin and full of shame. He sent his one and only son to die for you, to pay the price for your sins. And and, and God had him die so that the wrath that he had towards you would be appeased. And the way that we know that God was pleased with this sacrifice is that Jesus came back from the dead on the third day. And that first Easter morning, when the tomb was open and the stone was rolled away and Jesus came back from the dead, it's as if God yelled down the concourse of time and he said, you are greatly loved because my son was enough. For every sin, for every sin, my son was enough. And all he asks from us is to have faith enough to believe it, to turn from our sin and to run towards the loving arms of God, the only place we'll ever find enough mercy and grace for all the sin we've ever committed. It is there in the loving arms of God that we realize we are greatly loved. So my friends, I I end by saying to you, I want you to be comforted in the love and the mercy of God, no matter what you've done. I want you to trust 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sin, he loves us. It doesn't actually say he loves us, but it's written in this tone of love. It says that he's he's, he's just and able to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Only a loving God could do that. And so while he may discipline you and correct you, it's because he loves you. And he wants to make you more like his son. And while it may sting for a moment or a month or three months, the payoff is worth it. So press on. And remember that you are greatly loved. 
A final analogy that I think will bring this to your life as it's brought it to mind, it's been meaningful for me this last few months, is the analogy of, uh, of the runner in that film, Chariots of Fire. Remember Eric Liddell in that 1981 film? He's this Scottish guy raised in China by these missionary parents. And near the end of the film, there's this running scene where he's running against these competing runners and And he's trying to run the race, to win the race, keeping his awkward stare towards God to give glory to God for his run. But he gets off balance. And he falls into the infield of the racetrack. And stop the tape for just a second. He's running this this race. And then watch this. He's faced with a moment here where he has to make a decision. Do I just give up? Do Do I just stop here and give up? Because there's no way I'm gonna win. Or do I get back up and do I keep going? And there are moments in our life where it feels like the shame is so thick and the verdict of guilt is so strong that we've been knocked into the infield and I can't get back up. And yet the gospel tells us a different story. The gospel says get up. And Eric Lydell gets up and he starts running again. And he's running and running and running, not just to catch up, but to win the prize. And there are moments, my friends, where it will feel like we cannot get back up. Our foot has slipped in so many ways. But you have to make a decision to get back up and to keep going. And I promise you that as you run, the Holy Spirit will sustain you. That Jesus Christ will correct you. And the word of God will be the foundation with which you run on for perseverance and with hope to win the prize. Run the race to win the prize. I'm choosing to believe every day that a broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. So my friends, let's cling to the promise together and run the race marked out for us. That if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, we can get back up. We can be set free. And it's all worth it. And at the end of this life, we will run into the arms of our Savior. And there, more fully than on earth, we will realize that we have been greatly loved. Amen? Amen. I want to close our service now by taking communion together. I think it's only appropriate. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to come forward at this time and to begin to pass out these elements. And I want us to talk about and think about what it means that we have been personally forgiven. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm gonna say, please join us by taking a cracker and a cup. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then maybe you just let this pass by you. That's just fine. That's a time for you to kind of think about what would it mean for you to give your life to Christ. But this is something that we do together as Christians to remember what Jesus has done for us. You're being passed out a little cup of juice and a gluten-free cracker. And I'm telling you, this little symbol is nothing spiritual in and of itself. But it's a symbol. It's, It's something to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus came to earth and put flesh on. He became a human. The cracker represents The very fact that he had flesh, he became like us. God could have chosen any other way to make himself apparent to us. He could have done any other supernatural event. But what did he do? He did something that seemed almost natural. He had Christ put on flesh, become like us. And the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gave thanks to the Lord for the bread, this unleavened bread that would have been on their table. And he broke it. And he instructed them that when they eat of the bread, they are to do so in remembrance of him. What are they remembering? They're remembering that God loved them enough to send Jesus Christ to be like them, to show them the way to God. My friend, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm saying to you today, there is a God who loved you enough to send his son to be like you, to show you how you can be reconciled with God. And all you have to do is believe. The bread represents that he took on flesh to be like us. But then there is a cup of juice. This is a part of our communion meal. It would have been a part of their meal, though probably a glass of wine, maybe the fourth glass of wine. And he lifts this up 
And he gives thanks to it, to the Lord for it. He himself said, I will never drink of this cup again till I'm with you in heaven. But then he said, this represents my blood which is spilled for you. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. You see, no longer do we have to sacrifice things in our own efforts to appease the wrath of God. Christ sacrificed his one and only son to appease his own wrath. And so the cup says, he is enough. My blood spilled out for you to blot out your transgressions and to forgive you. Whenever you drink of this, you may do so in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul later says, whenever we come together, we should be taking this together. He tells us that this is a way for us to remember Christ and the gift that he gave us. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a few moments to just remember Christ. We're going to sing the beginning of this song, and then we're going to come up, and I'm going to take this with you. We're going to take this all together. But I want us just to take a few moments and remember the greatness of Christ. Now, yes, of course, ask for forgiveness for your sin. But don't put your sin in the spotlight. Put the greatness of God on display in your life. And for a moment, realize that Christ is enough. It's in him and him alone that you've been saved. Reflect on the greatness of Christ. Ask for forgiveness for your sins. In a moment, we will take all of this together. alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I'll stand. alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came and to save till on the cross as Jesus died the breath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live This is called communion. It's a way that we commune with the Lord, but it's also a way that we commune with one another. It's an act that Christians do together. This isn't to be done in the privacy of our own homes by ourselves. This is the body of Christ, remembering that Christ is our head. And so together we will take this now. Jesus said, when you eat of the bread, do so in remembrance of me. You may eat of the cracker now. I want you to hear the promise. And Jesus said, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until I'm with you again. There's promise there. There's anticipation there. There is a day we will be back together with him. And the only way that we could ever have that hope is by knowing that we have been fully forgiven. So the fruit of the vine, this grape juice represents to us 
that we have been forgiven by the blood of Christ. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of Christ. You may drink of this now. Oh God, our Father, Yahweh, Lord, Redeemer, Reclaimer. God, we thank you for what you have done in our life and the way that you have made us new in Christ. We thank you for Christ's sacrifice, but we thank you that he didn't stay dead, that he rose again, and that in him we can find true life. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you, God, that you have freed us from the power of shame and guilt. And Father, I pray that you will help us live in freedom, the freedom of Christ, that we will live in Christ alone. It's in his perfect name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Rise to your feet. Let's sing this. the ground his body lay light of the world and darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day now from the great hero the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever hold me from his hand till he returns. Oh, church well as you leave from these walls know that you are not just sort of loved not kind of loved just so so loved you are greatly loved have a wonderful week <laughs>